Okay, so in this video, I'm going to um, continue on with uh, the 2007 exam. I'm going to go through questions 3, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, in this question, find the equation of the tangent to the curve x cubed minus 2x squared y plus 2y squared equals 2. Well, first of all, whenever you see this x and y in an equation, we, we can't just do differentiation, we have to do implicit differentiation. And what does that word implicit mean, I guess? Um, if you think about it, we can't, if we had y is equal to 2x squared plus 2, we have y in terms of, uh, of x, so we can explicitly differentiate that. So think about the word explicit. Now, if we have uh, x and y, well, we can't explicitly uh, derive in terms of y because we don't have y in terms of x. We can't divide into y the x so, um, so easily. So we have to use implicit differentiation here to do this. Now, uh, let's, so let's go ahead and do that. And um, so I guess what I would write is, uh, we need to find the equation of the curve and uh, the equation of the tangent. Now let's think about the equation of the tangent. Well, the equation of tangent is a line and that line has an equation y equals mx plus c. So if we can find uh, dy dx, we're going to get this uh, we're going to get this equation and tangent here, we're going to get the gradient, and then we can go ahead and find this. So uh, let's implicitly derive, let's derive both sides. So I guess what we're doing is d by dx, first step, and we're also doing the same on the right hand side. Okay, so the right-hand side we're deriving a constant, so that's going to be zero. But on the left-hand side, let's go ahead and derive that. Well, deriving x cubed with respect to x is quite easy, isn't it? It's 3x squared. However, when we get to this uh, minus 2x squared y, well, we have to derive, if you were deriving this with respect to x, we would notice that we'd get minus 4x, and then we'd treat y as, as if it was a constant, so like so. But then we have to also consider that we're deriving uh, with respect to y. So uh, we've got minus 2x squared, and I guess we'd have dy dx uh, plus 4y dy dx. And the derivative of the right-hand side is just zero. Okay, so now what we need to do is uh, let's take out, we really want to have dy dx. So why don't we just move uh, everything that doesn't have a dy dx to the right-hand side. And so we'll take dy dx out as a common factor. And we're going to have 4y minus 2x squared. And on the right-hand side, we're going to have 4xy uh, take 3x squared. So if we were to divide uh, both sides by uh, this over here, then we're going to get an expression for the derivative dy dx is equal to 4xy minus 3x squared over 4y minus 2x squared. Okay. Um, now, if we have a look, the question is giving us some information. It's giving us that the, it's on the point 2, 3. So what we can then do is we can find um, the at what the derivative is at this point, which will give us this m here, because m is just the, uh, the gradient, which is constant in a line, isn't it? Think about a line. It's... The gradient, the rise over run, is the same everywhere. Okay, so uh, let's have a look at what. So at point two three, dy dx is equal to. Well, let's just sub that in. We'll sub that in. Four times uh, two is eight. Times three is twenty four. Minus twelve is going to be twelve over uh, four and that's going to give us three. Now, we've got our equation of our tangent, so our equation of the tangent
is y is equal to mx plus c, where m is equal to 3, isn't it? We just found that. And so therefore we've got y is equal to 3x plus c. Now, we've also got our point on our line, so where when x is equal to 2, y is equal to 3, as we've been given. So let's sub those in. We've got 3 is equal to uh, 2 times 3 is 6 plus c. So we've got c is equal to negative 3. Now, we're not done yet because we've, we've found what uh, m and c are. So now, for, to, to get your final mark, you have to state what the equation of the tangent is. So uh, your final, therefore, equation of tangent is y is equal to 3x minus 3. So in terms of this question, how did students go? Well, if I have a look at the examiner's report, 43% uh, of students got three full marks, which is three. However, 33% of students got zero or one mark. So um, a number of students really would have struggled to actually get started with the question. Mostly this question was done well, but not as well as, as you would have thought. Um, the, the implicit differentiation wasn't overly hard, um, and they might have made some mistakes uh, here, or certainly maybe not even answering the question. question. Um, but mostly that question would have been done fairly well. Uh, okay, let's move on to question four. Find the volume generated when the region enclosed by this, where you can read, uh, is rotated around the x-axis to form a solid of re revolution. Let's have a look. So I guess we're looking from, you know, we're looking from here to here and we're rotating it around this way to form this solid. Now, uh, the formula, first of all, considering we're looking at volume, is uh, we're going to say pi y squared, where the radius, the radius of this solid is actually going to be from here to here. So, uh, <coughs> so it's like pi r squared, where our radius is, uh, is the y value. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so first of all, we have to set up our equation and uh, <coughs> our volume is going to be, well, we're given, careful to keep the sign in place. We've got uh, the integral from negative a half to zero of pi y squared dx. So that's the first thing, and uh, we then take out this pi as a out the front, and we've got, well, y squared is 1, this is y, so y squared is 1 over 1 minus x squared dx. Now let's sort of stop here and, and have a look at this. Where is this for me? Well, there's, there's nothing we can really do to integrate this as such. Um, however, when we, we may remember that we can do partial fractions. So you should be able to recognise that we can do partial fractions. So therefore, we just stop where we are for now and go over to the side. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, so I've got 1, minus, uh, 1 over 1 minus x squared is just going to be equal. Well, we can split that up into 2. We've got a over 1 minus x plus b over 1 plus x. And we just want to find what a and b are to solve for that partial fraction. So we've got 1 is equal to, considering that these are both sort of equal, um, if we were to uh, multiply that fraction, this fraction here, over by this, and this fraction over here by that. So we've got a 1 plus x plus b 1 minus x. <coughs> okay, so uh, let's go ahead and do that. I guess let's say let we want to let x equal 1 because if we do that, that's going to cancel this out, which therefore implies we've got 2a is equal to 1, and we'll let x equal minus 1. That's going to cancel this out, so we've got uh, 2b 
is equal to 1. So therefore, A and B is equal to a half. And we found what A and B are, so now we can get, go ahead and um, say um, that 1 over 1 minus x squared is the same as 1 over 2, where a is 2, or over half, 1 minus x plus 1 over 2, 1 plus x. Now, this is looking a bit more familiar because if you think about it, we can, uh, when we integrate this, this is going to, we're going to get a log um, with a constant of a half out the front. So let's go ahead now and go back to our original question is we can now say that anything, we've got pi from negative a half oops, to zero of one over one minus x, and I guess we'll take the, the half out the front, plus one over one plus x dx. And if we were to write partial fractions in in uh, brackets, we can see that we're, we're referring to this over here. Okay, so that's how I guess how you can uh, you can really run out of room if you if you're not using the uh, the paper as you should. Let's just we've just used a little small fraction over here. So make sure you do do it to the side, otherwise you can get get quite messy. Um, okay, so let's we've we've taken out our um, constant of a half out the front of we already had pi, so now let's go ahead and integrate that, and that should be fairly easy. If I were to go to the 2000, when we're integrating, so we're looking at something over here, 1 over a constant is log e, well we've got x minus 1, which is the same, so we're going to have the integrate integral of x minus 1 is going to be log e of x minus 1, and importantly, we're looking at the modulus of, uh, I guess, uh, of that x, because uh, of we can't have the log of a negative number. Okay, so let's go back to where I was. And so what we've got is pi out 2 out the front, and we've got, uh, let's integrate this, the integral of 1 minus x is actually uh, negative log e to the 1 minus x uh, plus log e to the 1 plus x from negative a half to zero. And I guess from here you could you could go ahead and plug these values in, but one of the log laws that we know is that log uh, uh, negative log, let's say e to the ab, is equal to, I guess, if we were to have um, log e to the b of c d, then we can just go ahead, they're to the same base, so we've got c d over log e to the So we can do that. That you got to know that log log rule, and I guess it just saves us a little bit of time. Uh, so, sorry, I probably didn't explain that as well as I could have. Uh, so let's go. We've got log e to the one plus x over uh, one minus x from uh, negative a half to zero. Now, if we were to sub in uh, zero, we're going to have log e to the one over log e to the one. So log e to the base, anything to the log e to the base one is going to be zero. So that's going to be zero. Take away, pi on two. It's going to be take away uh, log e to the one. Uh, so uh, one minus a half is a half. So it's minus log e to the half over. Uh, 3 on 2. So, if we were to, uh, we, we should know that a half divided by 3 over 2 is equal to, let's flip these around, 
is going to be 1 over 2 times 2 over 3, which is going to be 1 third. So we've got pi on 2 minus log e to the 1 third. Now, that's out the front in brackets, isn't it? Okay, now from here, you could probably leave it like that. You could probably leave it like minus pi on 2 log e to the third. But let's use another log rule. If I was to say that um, we could say that p log e to the ab is equal to log e to the ab to the power of p. You should know that one. Now, considering that p in this case is negative 1, let's th one third to the power of negative 1 is just going to be equal to 3. So if we, we could therefore say the next line is that we have pi on 2 log e to the base 3. So that's our answer. Um, I guess you probably wouldn't have lost a mark had you not gone a step further, I, unless it would have said to have it in this particular form. Um, but I, you could have stopped uh, there and got your full marks, but I'm just sort of going into the next step. So, uh, so therefore, the volume is equal to pi on 2 log to the base e 3. And yeah, that's a full mark question. Let's have a look at uh, how the um, students went on average. 35% of students got full marks, but uh, alarmingly 44% of students only got zero or one mark. So um, if, you, if you really had trouble identifying that uh, we are finding a solid going in this direction and uh, using this, if you couldn't get started here, m most students really struggle to get any marks. Um, Students would have lost marks for a variety of reasons, either not having their dx, um, not doing the partial fractions correctly, that would have given you a mark. Um, certainly a lot of students would have made errors in here, particularly when integrating this, not having the negative sign. So they're just some things to keep an eye on. Uh, even, even this, 1 half divided by 3 over 2, you should re simply recognise that that's going to be a third without sort of thinking too hard about it or, or spending two minutes trying to work it out. So um, there's some uh, possible uh, errors that students made. And uh, look, let's have a look at question five. <coughs> uh, you can read the question, no doubt. Um, this is a simple kinematics one, really. Um, let's write down, always write down what you know. Uh, it, it says here that the mass is 6 kilograms. Um, we may not need that at the moment, but it says there that the block's initial velocity is 4. So u is 4 metres per second. It comes to rest in 3 metres. So let's say that x, our distance, is 3 metres. And our acceleration, we don't know, because it's asking us in the question. And uh, our initial uh, final velocity, well, it comes to rest in 3 metres. So v is equal to 0. Okay, so you need to find a, and you've got v, u, and x. Um, really important that you know which one we're going to use. Well, let's use v squared equals u squared plus 2ax. So therefore, we've got, uh, so you would write that. Write that down, what you're using. So really, for, for your two marks, this is a really easy question. Um, 0 squared is equal to 16 plus 2 times 3 times a. And remember, you can use this to skip a few steps as long as you don't make a mistake. We'll get this 16 over here. It's going to be negative 16. So we're going to say a. This implies that a is equal to negative 16 over 6, which is equal to meters per second squared. Let's divide by 2. We're going to have negative 8 over 3 metres per second squared. Now, pretty easy question. Um, and from there, if you couldn't get to that, you're going to have trouble with part B. But uh, let's have a look. Negative 8 on 3 metres per second squared. So what's happening is there's this initial uh, push 
uh, in this direction of this box and there's a friction force opposing that motion and that friction force I guess we don't know yet. However, um, we know that this, fric this box is pushed this way until the friction force uh, is to overcome um, that motion and to stop it within three metres. So if you think about the net forces, we've got this force which is applied this way and uh, but well we wouldn't say actually there's no force really applied it's, it's pushed at a constant speed so the net force is actually in this direction so basically we've got a net force which is friction opposing that motion however there is um, it is already traveling at four meters per second so eventually this friction force because it's it's in the opposite direction is going to bring it to a stop does so in three meters and um, so a net force is actually um, results in excel a deceleration to stop that calculate the uh, value of m well first of all Newton's second law Newton's second law states that uh, the resultant force is equal to the mass times the acceleration now we found what the acceleration is and our net force is really forget about if we have a look at this our net force in the horizontal where the acceleration is going these these are going to cancel each other out so our net force is really just this which is the friction force now um, friction if we define friction as a force the friction force is just really equal to now considering that left is, is going to be negative minus mu n and uh, if we were to say then that our resultant force is ma then therefore they have to be equal so we need to now find what m is so let's rearrange and and rearrange this formula we've got um, uh, m mu is equal to ma divided by we'll say minus n now our mass is uh, six kilograms and a from the previous question is minus eight on three and what is n well we're dividing uh, n is 6g so minus 6g okay so let's rearrange we've got these sixes are going to cancel out these negatives are going to cancel out and we've got this equal to 8 on 3g now it says here give your answer in the form b on cg well that's in the form we want so uh, so where B is equal to 8 C is equal to 3 now you may not need to do this to get your mark but it really does help you then identify okay yes I've answered the question in this form and uh, it's just going to eliminate um, the chance of making a mistake how do students go on that well I would imagine that the first half let's have a look first part of the question yeah, 70% of students got full marks for that. 17% um, got zero, 13% got one. Fairly straightforward question. The second half, however, done okay. Um, although 50% of students got zero or one mark. So basically it sort of polarized the cohort in which, uh, you know, 50% of students got full marks. Um, and look, that should be a stock standard sort of question. Um, but not, not knowing what Newton's laws are and not understanding the physics behind it is where students would go wrong. Okay, I'm going to do this, uh, go through question six. It will be the last thing I'll do in this video. I'll probably just stop at B. There is a part C to this, um, but that probably will require more explanation. I want to keep these videos under half an hour. Um, particle moves so that it's velocity. Uh, I would say that a lot of students tend to struggle with vector calculus. Um, this you know tends to be one of the harder topics not sure why um, certainly not the first part of the question um, but 
there are some aspects of vector calculus which some students can find confusing. Um, certainly not the first part. Um, if we have a look, first of all, let's have a look at if, if I've got a velocity, then if I uh, was to anti-derive, I can actually find its position. And um, if I was to look at the formula sheet, one thing that I really stress is that you need to know, um, you simply just need to know that uh, here's our, the derivative of RTT is going to give us um, the velocity. Okay, so, and ooh, what else have we got there? It doesn't really tell us much in the formula sheet. Anywho, um, so we have to uh, anti derive to find its position, basically. If we want, had its uh, position and we want to find its velocity, we derive. So that's, I guess, the whole point of it. And where does that come from? Well, uh, you know. V, the velocity is, I guess, our position, the rate at which the position is changing. So we, if we derive the position x, or in this case r, then we can actually find its velocity. And then if we derive the velocity, we can find the acceleration and so on. So if we had the acceleration and we had to find the position, we would have to anti-derive, we would have to anti-derive a, to then get to the velocity, and then we would have to anti-derive v again to find the position. Okay, so the r of t, don't forget your little vectors, is equal to the antiderivative of minus 4 sine of 2t, i, don't forget the components in this case, plus 6 cos of 2t j, uh, dt any derivative of minus 4 sine 2t is 2 cos 2t so just dividing uh, so by minus so it's 2 cos 2t i uh, and it's 6 divided by 2 is 3 3 sine so we've got 3 sine of 2t j and don't forget as well this constant because when we're anti-deriving we need this we need to find this constant so I guess that's where most of the the marks would come from this question what most students if they don't find that that's where they'll go wrong um, but this anti-deriving um, pretty easy stuff so this question was mostly well done uh, so we now have to consider that given that r of 0 is equal to 2i, then 2i uh, is equal to, well, 2 cos of 0, cos of 0 is 1, so that's going to be 2, 2i, sine of 0 is going to be 0, so that's going to be just 0j plus c. So therefore, that gives us that c is equal to 0. And now we can actually express the position now that we've found a constant. And constant just happens to be zero, so that's fairly easy. 2 cos of 2t, i, plus 3 sine of 2t, j. <coughs> okay, now the next question, which is a little bit more tricky. Find the Cartesian equation. Well, think of what is Cartesian? Our Cartesian coordinate system is that we have, you know, x and y. So that's what we need to do. Now, what is x? You wouldn't do this in your exam, but I guess this is what our x is, and this is our y. So let's go ahead and write that. x is equal to 2 cos of 2t, and y is equal to 3 sine of 2t. Now, I guess the important thing over here is that we know that the most important identity is sine squared of an, of an angle plus the cos squared of the same angle is equal to 1. So let's go ahead and uh, 
let's go x, let's square both sides. x squared is equal to 4 cos squared of 2t. And over the right hand side, y squared is equal to 9 sine squared of 2t. So um, let's divide both sides uh, to get uh, cos squared and sine squared. So we've got x squared over 4 is equal to cos squared 2t. And y squared over 9 is equal to sine squared of 2t. Now, if we were to add these together, we know that sine squared plus cos squared at the same angle is equal to 1. So if we were to add... Uh, so if we were to add 1 and 2, 1 plus 2 gives us... Well... On the right hand side, sine squared and cos squared is 1, so we've got x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9 is equal to 1, and that's our Cartesian coordinates. So first of all, identifying what each of these are will give you a mark, and your final mark is to have our Cartesian coordinate like this. A number of students might have made the error of using this as x and y. That might have been possible, um, but if they did, providing that they used, they got this right over here, which most students would have, you should have been able to use that. And you, you will use um, this property a lot, and that's the first one you would consider. All right, so I'm going to stop there, and in the next one I'll go through part C, and I'll finish off uh, the rest of that exam.